Good morning. Sorry, a few minutes late here. I was still studying and I didn't realize what time it was. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's Saturday. It is June 13th. And we are in the book of Genesis, um, the Passion Translation, and we're going through <coughs> um, verse by verse. We've been in this book for 70 two days. This is our 72nd day. Believe it or not, we've been in this book over two months. Um, it's not surprising as it's been just so rich and so packed and so full. And so today we're coming again to read about the life of Joseph. I'm going to read a short section here. We're in chapter 39. We're finishing chapter 39. And if you have the book, Passion Translation in, um, of Genesis, we will be on page 110. So here we go. God bless us. So much going on. It is the weekend. Time for you to catch up, enjoy Jesus, make um, new friends, <laughs> trust God. There's so many possibilities in one day, isn't there? just want to make a personal note here that last night was the first night I let Pepper, our dog, be in someone else's bedroom <clears throat> other than mine. She's been needing so much care in the night <clears throat> and I slept. So I honestly slept from the time I went to bed until about an hour ago, which Hasn't happened in a good two weeks because of being sick, but she's better. And she made it just fine with my daughter in her room, who didn't hear a thing because she doesn't wake up for stuff like that. <laughs> so, it's a perfect combination. Hi, Gail. Good morning. So here we are. We're going to get started right away because we've got a lot to cover here. Even though it's a short section, it's very rich and packed. So bless you as we read in page 110, verse 19 of chapter 39 is where we're starting. Joseph goes to prison and it says, When his master heard his wife's account about how his servant had treated her, he became furious. Potiphar is furious after hearing his wife's claims. So Joseph's master took him and threw him into prison. <clears throat> Potiphar threw Joseph into prison. The place where the king's prisoners are confined, and there he was left. But Yahweh was with Joseph <clears throat> and demonstrated to him his faithful love by giving him great favor in the spirit, I'm sorry, in the sight of the warden. So he had great favor with the warden. The warden put all the prisoners under Joseph's care. He was placed in charge of all the prisoners and everything in the prison. And the warden had no worries about the prison with Joseph in charge. Because Yahweh's presence, again, here it is, Yahweh's presence was with Joseph and caused everything Joseph did to prosper. Everything Joseph did prospered because of Yahweh's presence being with him. So that is the end of chapter 39, and I'd like to read um, these notes because um, what the author, Brian Simmons, brings out here is really important stuff about this short little passage we just read. All right, so uh, first of all, in, in verse 19, it says that Potiphar became furious, but it says in the notes here, the text does not say with whom Potiphar was furious. Perhaps he knew his wife's promiscu promiscuous ways. He only had Joseph thrown into prison when a man was a, with his authority could have had him killed. So he could have chosen to just kill Joseph, but instead he threw him into prison. And it could have been because he wasn't so sure that Joseph had done anything wrong. 
but he needed to take some sort of action. Um, perhaps he doubted the truth of her story, but to save face, he had Joseph in prison. Um, according to the Yalka, Yalkut Shemani, Asenath, Asenath is the daughter of Potiphar. That's her name, and her name means peril or misfortune. She did her best to convince her father of Joseph's innocence and what had really happened with her mother. Later, when Joseph was freed from prison, this is the woman that would become his wife, Asenath. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but that's interesting to note that um, she was she was his advocate and then became his wife. All right, and then I want to um, read a portion of Psalm 105 that I have here up on my computer. This is also the Passion Translation, and it discusses or talks about Joseph. But you can read this in your Bible, too, in Psalm 105. And um, it says that in verse 16, God decreed a famine upon Canaan land, cutting off their food supply. But he'd already sent a man ahead of his people to Egypt, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. But the word says that God sent a man ahead of the people Egypt. Not that man was in charge and the enslavement of Joseph had no purpose. No, it was very purposeful that he became a slave. And I think we need to keep highlighting these things in this story, that God is never the one who's caught by surprise, but he's, his plans unfolding in ways that we would prefer not to have to walk um, if we were Joseph, but this is his plan to get him to the highest place in the land. His feet, verse 18, were bruised by strong shackles and his soul was held by iron. God's promise to Joseph purged his character until it was time for his dreams to come true. So he, he was purging him all the time through these very difficult trials. Eventually, the king of Egypt sent for him, setting him free at last. And Joseph was put in charge of everything under the king, and he became the master of the palace over all of the royal possessions. Pharaoh gave him authority over all the princes of the land, and Joseph became the teacher of wisdom to the king's advisors. So um, I, will, I will stop there. That's Psalm 105. Verse 17 through 22, if you want to look at those. And that is a kind of a heads up to what's going to happen after this, um, because we know that Joseph will be getting out of prison because God is with him and he has a plan. But let me read a bit more here in the notes. In Psalm 105, we learn that Joseph's feet were in chains. And an iron collar was placed on his neck or his soul. Okay. Um, it would be hard to imagine a lower point in Joseph's life. Betrayed by his brothers, sold as a slave, and falsely accused. So here are three things that happen to Joseph. He's betrayed. And it's not just a betrayal by someone he doesn't know. He's betrayed by his own family. Then he is sold as a slave. And right now we have a lot of issues of race, racism in our country. And we need to remember that many of these people's ancestors were slaves, sold into slavery. There's a wounding there. And just like Joseph, there's the possibility and the probability of those who are walking in integrity that God's going to use this enslavement for his, his story, history, that he's going to turn it around. And three, he was falsely accused. So many times we find people in prison who are falsely accused and who are um, 
serving time for someone else's crime. And it's not just. And Joseph was doing all three of these things. Meanwhile, he suffered for a season until his time of deliverance arrived. As hard as it may seem, <clears throat> God may allow others to take advantage of us. Other people might be able to take advantage of us in order to carry out his secret will for our lives. You will let us look like the fool in order to perfect our character. This is the place where our king's prisoners are confined. In Ephesians 4.1, which I'm going to read to you, <laughs> describes what a prisoner of the Lord must look like. Be completely humble and gentle, it says in verse 1. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. So the unity of peace, the humble spirit, the teachable spirit is what God is looking for in his prisoners. So um, in verse 23, it says that um, the warden didn't have to worry about the prison because he could see the favor of God on Joseph's life. And Joseph had a God-favored life. That's what we all want to have. Um, to study, when we're studying the life of Joseph, it's actually a study on a life that has God's favor. He was faithful as a son. He was faithful as a shepherd. And he was faithful as a servant. He was diligent in all that he did. Wisdom always guided Joseph, even when he was living in a strange or foreign land. And everything he did, as a result, prospered. He not only adjusted to living in Egypt, but he flourished there. He became the personal attendant, administrator of Potiphar's affairs, and eventually the supervisor of the penal system. Joseph would never have been given such an honor if he'd not demonstrated a high degree of integrity and faithfulness. So integrity and faithfulness is what he demonstrated through being betrayed, being sold, betrayed by family, sold as a slave, and falsely accused. He met those three things with integrity and faithfulness. So he walked, he kept walking in integrity and faithfulness through these three trials and tests. And really like markers that were trying to mark him and trying to traumatize him. Um, integrity and faithfulness will pull you through that trauma. That's what you walk in. Um, Everyone could see that Joseph, that God was with Joseph. He that was faithful over a few things was now being given to rule over much. And that's the scripture in Matthew 25, 21, that if you're faithful, faithful over a few things or a little bit, or if God can trust you with $10, he'll give you $100. And don't think that the test of your money is not one of the most important tests that God gives each of us as stewards to see what kind of trust he can put in us. It's true. It's one of the most, the, the most um, common ways that God sees who he can trust, how we handle our money, So, which is actually his money. <laughs> so, so that's the end of chapter 39, and we're not going to go into what happens in the prison yet <laughs> till tomorrow. Um, let me see who's on here. Oh, hi, Barbara got on. Yay. And Sonny. Um, and she says, I have so much respect for Joseph. I know, right? He's incredible. Such an example of grace and forgiveness. And yes, we are striving for faithfulness. Well, so that's um, that's the scripture for today. And then, you know me, I always have one or two other things I want to say before we end. And I just, uh, this morning, <clears throat> excuse me, 
I'm just kind of looking at what's happening in Seattle. This is, it just has my attention right now. And there's a church that I've, I've listened to the pastor before. It's called um, Calvary the Hill. And um, the reason this pastor caught my attention, it was probably like four years ago or something, I want to say, was just because he was so brave to go into the red light district in um, Seattle's the Hill area and build a church right like right there just right on the heaviness of the streets there and he has been faithfully building this church and so when i learned of what was happening um, in the last week there um, i just reached out to him this morning Um, okay, so I asked him as intercessors how we could be praying for his church, and he's responding to me already this morning. He's saying, we are safe, and a lot of the news is inaccurate, not accurate. Things are peaceful, he's saying. What we are most in need of is wisdom. God has opened a door to us as a church, bringing this to our front door. Pray that he leads us to do what is next so he's asking that that we would pray for their church again this is called calvary the hill i think um you can look them up if you want to but they're right there in the middle of it and um, if you don't know what i'm talking about i'm talking about how there's been an area um in seattle where there is a marked um block area where they have closed the police police precinct and driven the police out and the odd part of it is that the mayor is okay with this and um president trump has stated that he would um, bring action if she does not so that the people and the businesses can return to order and to law and order and peace so um we do not want this to spread. This needs to be nip in the butt right there and no go no further in our country. Um, this kind of anarchy, I don't know how else to say it. So um, I just want to ask you to be in prayer. Today, would you take five minutes out of your day and would you go to the Lord and seek the Lord um, and declare, would you would you take five minutes to declare that um, whatever he tells you to, but that the Lord would bring back order into that area and into our whole nation. And um, just, just pray for the people who are in that area that um, there would be peace. And um, that, the, that the wickedness that the people who are trying to take over would be dispersed. And that, of course, no lives would be lost, et cetera. Um, I'm reading your comment here. Yes. So I'm not sure if they are in the in the Shaz. I don't know how you pronounce that zone. I just um, I know that it came to my attention in my mind because of being on the hill, and I don't know um, exactly where they are. So um, I have one other thing to two other comments. I have um, declarations that I just talked about yesterday that I, I really want to get out to everyone who's interested in making these declarations. They're very powerful. It's like you don't have to take time to write up or think up your own. Um, these are all encompassing for your city and your area. If you want me to um, send them to you, let me know. 
uh, we made these declarations last week in Reading, and I'm sure they would just be a blessing in every area of our country. And then um, if you are, um, I guess that's it. That's all I want to say. Okay, so Lord, thank you so much for the life of Joseph and what we're learning from him and how we take away from him um, the call to be faithful and to walk in integrity no matter what our circumstances and to never forget that you are orchestrating things behind the scenes if we will remain faithful and humble and pliable in your hands. In Jesus' name. Okay, I got a taker, so I'll send you a copy. Connie, and anybody else that jumps on here afterwards, I'll, I'll send it to you if you want. And that's it for today. Um, bless you all. And tomorrow we'll be in Chapter 40. And I love you and have a grace-filled, extraordinary Saturday. Bye.